Hello everyone, my name is Stu Adler. Welcome back to Introductory Lectures in Thermodynamics. In the last episode, we examined how workers describe equilibrium state properties of two component fluids, working through a number of examples involving vapor liquid equilibrium. Today, I'd like to continue this discussion, but focusing a bit more on equilibria among two or more condensed phases, such as liquids and solids. Although the same basic principles we discussed apply, Molecular interactions in liquids and solids tend to be much stronger than interactions in the gas phase, leading to some very interesting behavior. This behavior foreshadows discussions we'll have shortly about favorable and unfavorable molecular interactions in mixtures. To begin, consider one of the examples I shared with you on the first day of class, a mixture of N-butanol and water at 20 degrees C. Even after being violently mixed, this mixture spontaneously separates into two liquid phases, one richer in water, the other rich in butanol. How do workers describe this type of equilibrium, and what features do we expect to see in the thermodynamic data for a system like this? Recalling Gibbs phase rule once again, a single phase mixture of butanol and water would have three degrees of freedom. For other two component mixtures we examined in the last episode, these three degrees of freedom were often assigned to temperature, pressure, and composition with other intensive variables determined by equilibrium. By fixing pressure, we found we could represent these dependent variables, as well as stability regions of the various phases, as 1D contours on a 2D plot of temperature versus composition, also known as a TX diagram. For example, in the last episode, we used a TX diagram of benzene and toluene mixtures to understand multi-stage distillation. Shown here is a generic representation of a TX diagram for a binary liquid mixture of two species A and B that exhibit partial miscibility of the kind we see with butanol and water. Along the vertical axis is temperature. Along the horizontal axis is XA, the mole fraction of species A, spanning 0, corresponding to pure B, to 1, corresponding to pure A. At lower temperatures and high values of XA, the mixture can exist as a single A-rich liquid, labeled here as phase alpha. Likewise, for values of XA approaching zero, the mixture can exist as a single B-rich liquid, labeled here as phase beta. However, for a significant range of compositions in the middle, the system is not stable as a single liquid phase, and instead splits into two liquid phases, alpha and beta, at equilibrium. Note that this does not mean A and B completely separate. Rather, they form phases that are richer in one species than the other. For any given temperature, we can draw a horizontal tie line across the two phase region, revealing the compositions Xa alpha and Xa beta of the two equilibrium liquid phases. As with the many examples we looked at in the last episode, position along this tie line corresponds to the overall composition of the system and thus depends on the relative amounts of the two liquid phases. A common molecular explanation for this type of behavior is an unfavorable energetic interaction between molecules A and B, meaning that A and B molecules are less attracted to each other than they are to other A or B molecules in a pure liquid. At lower temperatures, this unfavorable interaction is strong enough to overcome the probabilistic tendency of molecules to mix randomly and causes the molecules to segregate into two phases, both with higher numbers of like molecules. However, as we'll discuss in the coming weeks, increased temperature tends to favor random mixing. Thus, liquid mixtures that are immiscible at lower temperatures often become increasingly miscible as the temperature is raised. For some mixtures, there is a transition similar to a critical point where beyond a certain temperature, we no longer observe two separate liquid phases at any system composition. This threshold is called the upper critical solution temperature, also known as the upper consolute point. Above this point, the system can only form a single liquid phase. As a simple example of upper critical solution behavior, shown here is a mixture of methanol and methyl pentane. This mixture exhibits an upper critical solution temperature of 26 degrees C at a concentration of about 30% methanol. Under the conditions shown here, the ambient temperature is about 20 degrees C, which is below the upper critical solution temperature. Thus, even after agitation, the solution remains cloudy, indicating precipitation of two liquid phases. 
As with the water butanol mixtures we've seen, an alcohol soluble dye has been added so we can distinguish the two liquid phases. In this case, the methanol rich phase is more dense than the alkane rich phase, so ultimately segregates to the bottom of the container. However, what happens if we heat the solution? Human body temperature is about 37 degrees C. So if I warm the container in my hand for a few minutes, the temperature of the mixture will become greater than the upper critical solution temperature. Immediately following heating, the two phases remain separate due to gravity, but upon re-agitation, the solution forms a clear mixture, indicating complete miscibility. Although random mixing ultimately prevails above a certain temperature, we might expect the unfavorable interactions to persist even when the solution remains single phase. Indeed, if we look at even higher temperatures, where the liquid mixture vaporizes and becomes a gas, we can see that the vapor region extends down to a much lower temperature than the boiling points of the pure components at Xa equals zero or one. This suppression of the boiling temperature corresponds to an increase in overall volatility relative to the pure liquid phases, consistent with the molecular interactions in the mixture being less attractive than in the pure liquids. A notable consequence of this suppression of the boiling temperature is that the two-phase liquid vapor region bends downward, separating into two separate lobes. The point where these two lobes join is called the azeotrope. An azeotrope is defined as a point where a binary mixture exists as a liquid and gas with the same composition at equilibrium. The significance of an azeotrope is that it represents the composition where A and B switch in relative volatility. This can be seen by drawing tie lines within the lobes of the two-phase gas-liquid region. To the left of the azeotrope, the mole fraction of A in the gas is higher than in the liquid at equilibrium, meaning A is more volatile than B. But to the right of the azeotrope, the mole fraction of A in the gas is lower than in the liquid at equilibrium, meaning A is less volatile than B. At the azeotrope itself, A and B have exactly the same volatility, corresponding to a tie line that is collapsed to a single boiling point. For this reason, azeotropic mixtures are notoriously difficult to separate via distillation, which as we saw previously, relies on relative volatility to affect separation. In some cases, liquid mixtures never reach an upper consolute point. Instead, they remain partially miscible at all temperatures up to the lowest boiling point of the mixture, resulting in a phase diagram that looks more like this. This situation leads to a very interesting phenomenon called a heteroazeotrope, defined as the point where both immiscible liquids, alpha and beta in this example, are in stable equilibrium with the gas. According to Gibbs phase rule, when three phases are present, the number of degrees of freedom is one. However, we've already fixed pressure. Thus, there are no other degrees of freedom. This means that at the heteroazeotrope, all phase intensive properties, including temperature and the mole fractions of A in all three phases are determined by equilibrium. These equilibrium values correspond to the points marked in red, phase beta, blue, phase alpha, and purple for the gas. As a concrete example, shown here is the TX phase diagram for mixtures of N-hexane and methanol at a half atmosphere. For those of you still waiting for today's cartoon, now is the moment. When I first began using a similar example in class several years ago, my then six-year-old son pulled a discarded copy out of the recycle, drew a face on it, and then showed it to me, announcing with glee, Look, Dad, Pikachu! From then on, this became known to chemi students at the University of Washington as the Pikachu diagram. Japanese anime has evolved somewhat since I was a kid, but whatever mental associations help you better understand thermodynamics, I'm all for it. With the help of our favorite Pokemon, let's try to predict the identity and compositions of phases that will be present in the system at various temperatures, spanning 17 to 47 degrees C assuming an overall system composition of 8% methanol. With the average system composition fixed at 8%, all the points we are interested in will fall along a vertical line, drawn here in red. Examining the lowest temperature, 17 degrees C, we see that this point falls just inside the two-phase liquid-liquid region. Thus, we'll have a hexane-rich liquid, phase beta, with a concentration of about 6% methanol, 
and a small amount of a methanol-rich liquid, phase alpha, with a concentration of 85% methanol. The next point, 31 degrees C, appears to fall in the single phase liquid region, meaning we'll have a single liquid phase with a concentration of 8% methanol. However, heating to 35 degrees C, we enter the two phase liquid vapor region, where we will have a liquid with a concentration of about 3% methanol and a gas with a concentration of about 40% methanol. Finally, at the last point, 47 degrees C, we seem to be in the gas phase region, and thus we will have a single phase gas with 8% methanol. Okay, great. But now let's try to up the ante a little bit by asking how much of each phase will be present under a given set of conditions. In this case, let's assume we have 100 moles of a mixture with an overall concentration of 70% methanol, and consider temperatures below, above, or near the heteroazeotrope. Starting with T equals 25.0 degrees C, an overall mole fraction of 0.7 sits in the middle of the two-phase liquid-liquid region. Drawing a tie line, we see that we'll have a hexane-rich liquid beta with X equals 0.08 and a methanol-rich liquid alpha with X equals 0.83. To get the amount of each phase present in the system, we can write a balance statement for the total moles N as well as the moles of methanol, which is X times N. Rearranging, we see that the overall mole fraction of methanol, X, in the system can be expressed as a weighted average of methanol mole fraction in the two phases, X alpha and X beta. The weighting factor in this case is F alpha, the fraction of the total system moles that are in phase alpha versus phase beta. Note that F alpha is exactly analogous to the idea of quality in a gas-liquid mixture. We just don't call it quality in this case, because both phases are liquids, but is conceptually the same thing. Solving for F alpha in terms of the mole fractions in the system in the two individual phases, and plugging in numbers, we find that 83% of the total moles in the system will be in phase alpha, while 17% will be in phase beta. In other words, if we have 100 moles total, 83 will be in liquid phase alpha, while 17 moles will be in liquid phase beta. Since the composition axis on this plot is linear, another way to visualize F alpha is as the fractional position of the system composition along the tie line, extending from phase beta to phase alpha. Next consider T equals 35.8 degrees C, which is above the heteroazeotrope. This point sits in the middle of the two-phase gas-liquid region. Drawing a tie line, we see that we'll have a methanol-rich liquid alpha with X equals 0.94 and a gas with X equals 0.56. Once again, defining the quality as the fraction of total moles that are in the gas phase, we can re-express this quality in terms of the mole fraction of methanol in the system and the two individual phases. Plugging in numbers, we find that 63% of the total system moles will be in the gas, while 37% will be in the liquid phase alpha. As with the phase fraction in the case of two liquids, we can likewise visualize quality as the fractional position of the system composition X along the tie line from X liquid to X gas. Finally, let's also look at T equals 32.7 degrees C which sits near the heteroazeotrope. However, one problem we have here is that the resolution of the plot is not good enough to tell us whether 32.7 degrees C is slightly above, slightly below, or exactly at the heteroazeotrope. If it is slightly above the heteroazeotrope, we will have two phases, a methanol-rich liquid alpha and a gas. On the other hand, if 32.7 degrees C is slightly below the heteroazeotrope, we will have two liquid phases, alpha and beta, and no gas. We've already treated both these cases, so let's instead assume that the system is exactly at the heteroazeotrope, in which case we will have three phases, two liquids, beta and alpha, with methanol mole fractions of 0.10 and 0.81, respectively, 
and a gas containing 46% methanol. How much of these three phases will we have? Recall that with two phases, we could write conservation statements for total moles and moles of methanol and solve for the moles in each phase. However, if we try to do that here, we find that we have three unknowns, the moles in the gas and the moles in each liquid phase. Mass conservation only gives us two equations. This implies that there is another hidden system intensive variable besides mole fraction that is co-determining the amount of each phase. Any guesses? Here's a hint. What other properties have we covered in the last few episodes that changed dramatically as a system evolves from liquid to gas? Hopefully you recall two of them, molar volume and molar enthalpy. Thus, to obtain a third relationship, we could write a balance statement involving one of these properties. Taking enthalpy, for example, we can say that n times h of the system must be a sum of n times h in the three individual phases. This gives us a third equation, which we can use to solve for the three variables. However, for this to work, we'd need to know the molar enthalpy of the system. Also, we'd need some data, either H contours added to our TX diagram or an HX diagram. We don't have any of that here, so it's not possible to determine the amounts of each phase without gathering more information. As we'll discuss next week, the interesting phase behavior we see here is a consequence of very strong energetic and entropic interactions among molecules in condensed phases, where molecules are close to each other. As you can imagine, such interactions tend to be even more dominant in solids. As an example, shown here is a generic TX diagram depicting the phase behavior of a binary mixture of two metals. Above the melting point of the two individual metals A and B, the system exists as a single liquid phase. However, when the system is cooled to form a solid mixture, A and B are no longer entirely miscible. Over a wide range of system compositions, the system precipitates into a two-phase mixture of two solid phases, a B-rich solid, beta, and an A-rich solid, alpha. Also shown in the diagram are two-phase liquid solid regions, where the liquid is in equilibrium with either the beta or alpha solid phase. It's also possible for both solid phases to be in equilibrium with the liquid. This point is called the eutectic. You may have noticed the remarkable similarity of this diagram to the Pikachu diagram we examined previously. Indeed, a eutectic is exactly analogous to a heteroazeotrope. Just as the boiling point of a mixture is suppressed relative to the pure liquids near a heteroazeotrope, the melting point of a mixture is suppressed relative to the pure solids near a eutectic. Just as the relative volatility of the two species are opposite in the two gas liquid regions above the heteroazeotrope, the relative solubility of A and B are opposite in the two liquid solid regions above a eutectic. As you can imagine, these similarities indicate a similar underlying cause. In this case, species A and B mix easily as a liquid, but have an unfavorable interaction as a solid mixture that drives them to precipitate as separate solid phases. Reduced miscibility in solids can be understood largely in terms of their directional bonding and crystal structure. In liquids, atoms or molecules adopt a somewhat random arrangement, so permit random mixing more easily. But in a solid, atoms and molecules tend to order themselves in some kind of repeat lattice, and this order is disrupted by random mixing. In fact, metal alloys are actually remarkable in how miscible they remain even as solids. For many crystalline substances, mixing as a solid cannot really occur, leading to a phase diagram that looks more like this. In this case, A and B are completely miscible as liquids, but as solids can only exist as completely separate pure phases. At first glance, it might appear that the single phase alpha and beta regions on the diagram are gone. But what's really happened is that alpha and beta now correspond to pure A and pure B, which only exist at the vertical axes of the plot at xA equals 0 or 1. For this reason, material scientists often call them line phases. In such a system, it's not possible to have a homogeneous solid mixture under any conditions except pure A or pure B. An interesting situation that often occurs in solids is co-precipitation of two or more species 
in a single ordered crystal, such as a salt hydrate or other ordered phase with a distinct ratio of atoms or molecules. Such crystalline substances constitute their own distinct line phase and can lead to multiple solid-solid and solid-liquid two-phase regions. In such a system, solid mixtures can only vary in composition by changing the relative amounts of the line phases, not by composition variations within each phase. To take us through a specific example, shown here is a binary phase diagram for mixtures of H2O and sodium chloride at one atmosphere. This diagram shows that under ambient conditions, around 20 degrees, sodium chloride and water can only exist as a single homogeneous liquid phase, called brine, at conditions up to about 30 weight percent NaCl. This is exactly what we saw in episode A2, where I showed you various amounts of salt dissolved in cold water on a scale. At one atmosphere, and about 5 or 10 degrees C, I was able to vary the mass fraction of salt as an independent variable up to about 30 weight percent. Returning to our phase diagram, these samples correspond to the points shown here. Since this is a single phase region, the composition at each of these points represents the locally uniform concentration everywhere in the solution. However, I also showed you that increasing the overall mass fraction of salt beyond about 30% does not cause any further increase in the salt concentration in the liquid. Instead, the additional salt is accommodated by increasing amounts of solid salt on the bottom of the beaker as a second phase. The samples in this photo correspond on the phase diagram to the points shown here in the two-phase region. As we saw in the beaker, no actual substance with a locally uniform weight fraction of 0.53 or 0.8 actually exists. Instead, we form two phases, a solid line phase consisting of 100% sodium chloride, and a liquid brine containing about 30% salt. The overall composition of the mixture along this tie line corresponds to the relative amounts of the two phases. As with many solid-solid mixtures, sodium chloride and H2O form a three-phase eutectic, in this case involving ice, brine, and solid salt hydrate at minus 21 degrees C. Recalling Gibbs' phase rule again, we predict for two components and three phases that there's only one degree of freedom. We've already chosen pressure to be one atmosphere. This implies that if we enforce a physical mixture of salt and ice, it will spontaneously cool to minus 21 degrees C and stabilize as three phases, pure ice, pure salt hydrate, and brine, with about 22 weight percent salt dissolved in it. Perhaps you have had the experience of making ice cream the old-fashioned way by placing it in a sealed canister inside a barrel and packing the annular space around the canister with ice and salt. By continuously feeding the barrel with fresh ice and cold salt and draining off the liquid, the melting of the ice absorbs kinetic energy, pulling the temperature of the mixture down to the eutectic and freezing the ice cream inside the canister. In all the examples of condensed phases we've discussed so far, We've assumed that some mechanism exists for the system to reach equilibrium. However, one issue that arises in understanding the thermodynamic properties of solids is that molecular motion is often severely restricted in a solid, making it difficult, especially at lower temperatures, for the system to actually reach equilibrium. Nonetheless, we can often use thermodynamic data and principles to predict important aspects of structure and composition, even when a system does not fully reach equilibrium. We can also use equilibrium phenomena as a way of engineering formation of non-equilibrium structures. As a final thought for this episode, I'd like to share with you a couple of examples. The first is solder, which is a metal alloy used to bond metals in a variety of applications, including electronics and plumbing. Until recently, the most commonly used solder was based on a mixture of lead and tin which melts at fairly low temperatures and wets many metal surfaces. In electronics, the objective is to produce a soft ductile alloy with large grains that freezes congruently, meaning it changes phase at a single temperature, making it easy to work with. For this reason, the composition of electronic solder is 62 weight percent tin. Thus, when the liquid solder solidifies, it happens all at once at the eutectic co-precipitating thin layers of lead-rich and tin-rich alloys of constant composition that grow together into a microstructure with large uniform grains. 
In contrast, plumber sealing copper pipe often use an alloy with higher lead concentration, between 30 and 50 percent tin. Here the objective is to produce a harder, stronger alloy with smaller grains that is fracture resistant and also freezes over a range of temperatures allowing longer working time for sealing joints. As shown in the TX diagram, as a liquid mixture with 30 weight percent tin is cooled, it will first precipitate small spherical nuclei of a lead-rich alloy with 12 weight percent tin. As cooling continues, the nuclei grow as increasingly lead-rich alloy precipitates on the surface of the particles. This results in a gradient in tin concentration inside each particle, spanning 12% in the center to about 18% on the outside surface. Finally, the system reaches the eutectic, at which point thin layers of lead-rich and tin-rich alloys grow out from the particles and fill in the spaces between the lead-rich spheres. In the final microstructure, these lead-rich particles act like rip-stop nylon, substantially increasing strength and fracture resistance. This is an example of incongruent melting, which occurs over a range of nearly 100 degrees C as the pipes cool, providing a long working time for the plumber and avoiding leaks caused by the solder solidifying too quickly. What this example illustrates is that even though the microstructure of solder is not an equilibrium structure, Thermodynamics, nonetheless, has an important impact on many aspects of this microstructure. These include the composition inside the lead-rich and tin-rich layers, the presence or absence of the lead particles, and the gradients in composition within these various regions, all of which have important effects on the homogeneity, structure, and properties of the solder. As a second example, consider the problem of producing small nanoparticles, which have applications in many areas including electronics, medicine, and chemical catalysis. Making tiny uniformly sized particles just by grinding up large samples of material is nearly impossible below about one micron. One approach workers have taken is to use some kind of templating process, which uses an equilibrium structure with nanometer sized features to direct formation of the particles. As an example, consider the structure and function of soap. Soaps are typically composed of amphiphilic molecules that have a polar or ionic head group and an organic tail. An example is sodium lauryl sulfate, or SLS, commonly used in shampoo. As a result of its structure, it interacts favorably with both water and organic liquids, allowing it to help dissolve oils and fats in aqueous solution. When dissolved in water at low concentration, SLS acts in a similar way as other soluble salts, producing a solution with continuously variable properties that depend on salt concentration. However, beyond a certain concentration, called the critical micelle concentration, the soap molecules band together into colloidally sized spherical assemblies called micelles. The interior of the micelle contains the organic tails of each SLS molecule, but excludes H2O. Meanwhile, the polar head groups of the molecules line the outer surface of the micelle and interact with the water in the surrounding fluid. These micelles are stable indefinitely in solution with a size, shape, and concentration that depends on temperature, pressure, and the concentration of SLS. In addition, at higher concentrations, the micelles themselves can reorganize into larger structures such as tubes and bipolar lamella. As shown in this TX diagram, solutions with these structures often behave as single-phase fluids over a wide range of composition. The system composition can also fall into a two-phase region where more than one type of structure can exist simultaneously in equilibrium, such as micelles plus tubes, tubes and sheets, and so forth. Thus, by controlling temperature and SLS concentration, it's possible to predictably and repeatably form structures with well-defined size and shape the formation of such structures are often described in the literature as self-assembly, since the molecules themselves form these structures spontaneously. If non-ionic surfactant molecules and some water are dissolved in an organic solvent, a similar thing happens. The system self-assembles into reverse micelles, which have an aqueous interior and organic tails lining the outside, allowing them to dissolve in the organic solvent. If one then dissolves water-soluble precursors, such as inorganic metal ions, they concentrate in the interior aqueous parts of the reverse micelles, where they can form a nanoparticle. After subsequently drying or burning away the organics and moisture, 
one is left with tiny nanoparticles that have taken the shape of the micelles they formed in. Although the formation of the particles themselves is often a non-equilibrium process, the self-assembly of the micelle template is predictable by equilibrium and can be used to control the size and shape of the particles over some range.